Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. <clears throat> on behalf of USAID, Feed the Future, and AgriLinks, I want to welcome you to our Spotlight webinar, Global Evidence for Improving Resilience and Food Security, Findings from the Reaper, Agriculture-Led Growth, and Nutrition-Sensitive Agriculture Evidence Gap Maps. I'm Michael Saltz with AgriLinks, and before we begin, I want to orient you to our Zoom event. On the bottom of your screen, you'll see most of your controls. First, Please use the chat to introduce yourself and network with colleagues from around the world. To ask questions, please use the Q&A button in the toolbar on the left and indicate who your question is for. You can ask questions throughout the event and our Q&A session will be at the end of the webinar, though we may answer questions throughout. Lastly, we are recording this webinar and will email you the post-event resources, including the full slide deck as soon as they are available. And you can find the resources at agrilinks.org when they are ready. Thank you for your attention. I will now pass it to Chris Hilbrenner, Analysis and Learning Division Chief at the USAID Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. Thanks, Michael, and welcome everyone. Uh, very happy to see such a robust audience here this morning for what I think is gonna be a really great discussion. As Michael mentioned, my name is Chris Hilbrenner. I'm the Division Chief for Analysis and Learning within USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. And I'm really excited to be here as we share the results from the Reaper activity. Over the past three years, the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security has begun a series of efforts to further build a culture of evidence-based decision-making within RFS. This has included a renewed focus on supporting high-quality impact evaluations, and the launch of an annual Bureau pause and reflect process to directly connect new learning with Bureau strategy and guidance. One especially important component of these efforts has been the work of the Reaper activity to map the evidence underpinning the technical approaches that we promote through our agriculture, WASH, nutrition, and resilience technical centers. These evidence maps are really exciting because they will allow us for the first time to take a consistent cross-bureau approach to understanding the state of our evidence base. Where are more impact evaluations needed? Where do we have enough evidence, but we need to synthesize? And where do we have both the evidence and synthesis to do the best evidence-based programming? At the same time, doing this kind of work although it's really critical, uh, it also requires significant human and financial resources. And these demands can often limit the level of evidence mapping that we do. And so Reaper also focused on developing new machine learning tools to help speed up these processes and reduce the burden of mapping evidence. So today's presentation will cover both of these aspects of the the Reaper One work and provide recommendations for areas of further exploration. I also hope it will be an opportunity for a lively discussion about how we can build off this work moving forward. As I mentioned before, the scale of the work covering four really complex technical areas has been quite large. And so I'd like to close these opening remarks just with a big thank you to the implementers of this work, MIT, 3IE and Notre Dame. And a big thank you to my colleague, Zachary Baquet, our strategy and learning advisor who oversaw the activity. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Carolyn Huang from 3IE to kick off the presentation. Thank you, Chris. Next slide, please. So for today's agenda, um, I will be providing an introduction to the Reaper technical team and implementing team, uh, as well as some background about the Reaper project. And then we will hear from key contributors, including um, Kristen Edwards, um, representing the machine learning team with MIT and University of Notre Dame, and also get an overview of key findings from the nutrition sensitive ag evidence gap map, as well as the ag-led growth uh, evidence gap map. Um, I will then highlight um, additional findings from our resilience and WASH work, 
as well as some cross-cutting findings um, from the entire project. And then we will proceed with question and answers for about 30 minutes um, before hearing from Zachary um, also with RFS on closing remarks. Next slide, please. Okay, so today I have the pleasure of introducing myself and fellow contributors from the Reaper technical team that comprises the International Initiative for Impact Evaluation, as well as uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, so I am a senior evaluation specialist with 3IE, and I have led several research initiatives, including um, this USAID Bureau for Resilience and Food Security Evidence Aggregation for Programmatic Approaches project, um, as well as um, other key bodies of work for 3IE, including ag risk um, insurance thematic windows. I have about 10 years of experience working on research um, covering social protection, poverty alleviation, maternal child health, and modern slavery issues. Uh, my background is um, of a PhD from the University of North Carolina, um, as well as a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Michigan. Kristen Edwards is a PhD candidate in the DECODE lab at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She is a National Science Foundation graduate research fellow, an Ida M. Green fellow, and a GEM fellow. She earned her MS and BS in mechanical engineering at the Mass at MIT uh, and the University of Maryland, respectively. And at MIT, she studies machine learning applied to mechanical design with special interest in sustainable design and global development. Mark Engelbert is a senior evaluation specialist at 3IE. He manages 3IE's development evidence portal, um, a large repository of impact evaluations and systematic reviews, and supports the production of systematic reviews and evidence gap maps on a variety of topics, um, including agriculture and immunization. Before joining 3IE, Mark was a consultant for a number of development organizations, um, which examined experimental um, design on how new evidence affects the decisions of policymakers, as well as exploratory research to identify the most cost effective anti poverty interventions. He has a PhD in philosophy from the University of Maryland, um, a master's in international development, um, as well as um, a bachelor's in philosophy from the College of William and Mary in Virginia. And finally, uh, Last but not least, um, Charlotte Lane, who is a nutrition consultant for 3IE. Um, she is a nutrition and food security expert who has managed many of 3IE's cross-sectoral evaluation and synthesis projects to support food systems transformation and adoption of healthy diets. Um, she holds a Bachelor of Arts from Harvard University and a PhD in nutritional epidemiology from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Next, please. Okay, now I will proceed with um, explaining a little bit about the Reaper project. Next slide. Um, so a little bit of background. Um, the RFS Evidence Aggregation for Programmatic Approaches project is supported by RFS um, and was uh, funded through a grant um, under the site award that was managed by MIT with and, and also uh, provided additional support from um, the Feed the Future Knowledge Data Learning and Training Activity um, that is managed by Vixel Solutions Incorporated. Um, we'll mostly focus today on the technical work um, that was supported under the site award. Um, and so the, the first, um, objective was to map, leverage, and summarize new evidence bases. Um, and the scope of the project was primarily focused on four technical areas. Um, this is agriculture-led growth, nutrition-sensitive programming, um, water, water security, sanitation, and hygiene, as well as resilience. And this is because these are the four technical areas that RFS focuses on. Um, RFS is the agency's home for resilience and food security programming. It coordinates the American government's global strategies on food security and water, as well as the agency's multi-sectoral nutrition strategy. So we were tasked with 
examining the evidence base that underlies RFS's strategic and programmatic approaches, which guides its investments um, and engagement on policy and programming. Next slide. Yes, so the second objective was to highlight um, the evidence base that underlines uh, underlies RFS's strategic and programmatic approaches, as I mentioned before. Next slide. Oh, I mean, sorry, next. And then a third application, in addition to the production of evidence gap maps that um, help provide a knowledge management tool, was to also test and pilot new machine learning approaches um, to see if it could alleviate the labor intensive and resource intensive burdens of generating um, these types of evidence aggregation studies. Next. And then finally, uh, a fourth objective is to disseminate um, and discuss the learnings that came out of this project, which we are doing here today. Next. So before we delve into the results, I want to give a little bit of background about what is an evidence gap map. Um, so an evidence gap map is a knowledge management tool, and specifically it's a thematic collection of impact evaluations and systematic reviews that measure the effects of international development policies and programs. Now, to be clear, the research designs that we include within the evidence gap map are impact evaluations and systematic reviews of impact evaluations, because these are the research studies that are explicitly designed to answer questions about causal inference. Um, and we define impact evaluations uh, by the standard counterfactual based approach. This may include randomized controlled trials or quasi experimental approaches. Um, and systematic reviews in particular are evidence synthesis studies um, uh, that answer a particular research question about results and effectiveness of specific programs or policies. Now, what we did for each of the four technical areas is we produced an evidence gap map, um, creating an intervention outcome or in the WASH um, work, it was an outcome to outcome map. Um, but the Evidence gap map allows you to search by interventions um, and then search by outcomes of interest and really um, drill down and see what is the concentration or absence of evidence um, for that particular policy or research question. Um, and the visual overlay um, allows you to see what kinds of studies exist, whether they're impact evaluation studies, um, the size of the evidence base, um, as well as uh, the evidence that of um, methodologically uh, high confidence systematic reviews or medium or low confidence systematic reviews as well. Next slide. The specific research qu questions that are answered by an EGM um, are those pertaining to the extent and the distribution and characteristics of the evidence base. So as I mentioned, the EGMs are a knowledge management tool. They provide a snapshot of the evidence base um, and they can, they're a necessary first step to understanding where we are with the evidence base. So they can facilitate um, questions about effectiveness, but they do not directly answer questions about effectiveness and results. Um, you would need to take one step further and look at the systematic reviews to understand questions about effectiveness. However, it is an important first step to make sure we understand what the universe um, of evidence looks like. Um, and so specifically, we answer questions like, um, you know, where can we find the evidence? Um, to what extent does the evidence exist? What does it look like? Um, and this can help inform how we are investing our money in research as well as programming. Um, for program implementers, you might want to take a look at the evidence gap map and see, is the program that you're planning on um, implementing or proposing, is there evidence on it? Um, do we know if these approaches are effective? Or maybe is this a chance to um, encourage 
your collaborators to generate evidence that is direly needed to understand whether these approaches work. Um, the one thing, a couple of things that the evidence gap map does not do is it doesn't tell us what the evidence says. And, and we don't, we want to be careful about interpreting the absence or the concentration of evidence. So more evidence doesn't mean that the program actually works. You have to actually look at the studies within to determine results. Um, and similarly, a lack of evidence does not mean that that approach is not effective and we shouldn't keep investing in it. Um, it may reflect the challenges in evaluating these types of interventions, or it may reflect the nascence of that um, programmatic approach within development. Okay, next slide. All right, now I will turn the, um, my, the stage over to Kristen Edwards to discuss the machine learning findings. Thank you, Carolyn, and hello, everyone. My name is Kristen Edwards. I am a member of the MIT Decode Lab, and today I'll be discussing our work around machine learning, the research decisions we made, uh, the findings that came out of this, and learnings and implications for future work. So to start off, our goal was to implement state-of-the-art machine learning in order to accelerate the EGM design process. So to begin this, we had to gather a deep understanding of what the current EGM design process is. So we worked hand in hand with our three IE colleagues to develop this understanding. Um, so it starts with a literature search through the over 50 million published scholarly, data, uh, scholarly articles available on the web. And then through the keyword search and deduplication, we wind up with about 200,000 documents that move to the title abstract screening stage. Now this stage is the first wave of cuts in which uh, reviewers look through the title and abstracts of um, documents to determine if they're relevant for a specific evidence gap map. And if so, these documents move on to the full text stage. Um, and here there's about a 95% reduction uh, of documents that make it into full text. So we end up with around 10,000 documents uh, that are then screened via um, by two reviewers in the full text format, and ultimately most EGMs wind up with around 2,000 documents in the final product. So through talking with three IE members and understanding this process, we identified that step three, title abstract screening, would be our target step for accelerating the EGM design process. Now this was because, as I mentioned, it has one of the biggest cuts in documents um, that's done partially by manual reviewing, a 95% reduction. In addition, um, with our understanding of natural language processing, we were confident that state-of-the-art natural language processing could perform this step well. So next, I'd like to talk you through the history of language models throughout time. And we used this understanding in order to determine which language model we should use to accelerate EGMs. So early models were often frequency-based models. These are models that uh, look at the frequency of individual terms or words in a document. Um, moving from this came the process of topic modeling. Now this is quite similar, but instead of just individual words, um, groups of words or topics would be modeled together and the frequency of those topics would be used to define a document. Now, Natural language processing as a field took a massive step forward when the introduction of continuous language embeddings came about. This is the idea of representing words as vectors, where the vectors attempt to capture semantic meaning and relationships among words, and in vector space, similar words should be close to each other. And most recently, we've seen massive strides in language modeling with context-based embeddings. These are vector embeddings that change based on the context a word is in, and it uses transfer learning and attention-based transformers to get a really good understanding of language. One of the models that's really hit the scene um, that comes from context-based embeddings is ChatGPT, which you all might be familiar with. So our team hypothesized that moving from the current industry standard of frequency-based models 
to the state of the art natural language uh, processing based on context-based embeddings could provide um, great improvements in both model accuracy and human effort saved when um, making EGMs. So as a very brief um, background to context-based embeddings, these are built around transformers, which were introduced by Vaswani et al. in 2017. And in general, transformers are an architecture that's made of an encoder and a decoder. And ever since the introduction of transformers, many researchers have looked at decoder-only models. Now, these are great at natural language generation, like um, question and answering or uh, summarizing text using new language. And a tool that's come out from this is ChatGPT. But um, researchers have also looked at encoder-only models. So while decoder-only models were great at generating language, encoder-only models really shine at understanding natural language. And one such model that's particularly good at this is um, BERT, or bidirectional encoder representation from transformers. Because of this, we, we selected the BERT model as our um, state-of-the-art natural language processing model to move forward with. So looking at some results. Um, as a reminder, we're looking here at title abstract screening and how accurately we can classify whether a document should be included or excluded uh, to move on to the next stage. So for the three EGMs that we um, use this for, agriculture, nutrition, and resilience, we see that our proposed BERT model outperforms the industry standard model for classifying documents across all three. Now looking not just at classification performance, but also efforts saved, because um, one of the big goals in this project is to reduce some of the resource and time intensity required to make evidence gap maps. We wanted to look at how many papers experts need to screen in order to identify all of the relevant ones. Um, and so for some understanding of these figures, uh, we're looking at the proportion of papers screened on the x-axis and the inclusion rate on the um, y-axis, which is the number of includable documents that we've successfully identified. So an ideal case is shown here in the orange, which is when you um, only find and screen relevant documents, meaning that no effort is wasted screening a document that will be deemed irrelevant. And then a lower baseline is shown with this gray line, which is using no machine learning at all, and assumes that in order to find all relevant documents, if you're screening just randomly, you would have to screen all documents. So here are the results for the resilience EGM. Um, our model is shown with the blue line. The industry standard model is shown in yellow. And we see that for um, identifying, say, 80% of all relevant documents, uh, our BERT-based model is able to do this by only screening around 20% of all papers, whereas the industry standard has to do this by screening around 70%. So we see big effort gains um, in this case. And we see a similar trend across both the agriculture and nutrition EGMs. And ultimately, um, for all three EGMs, the average percent say, of effort saved um, through our BERT model over the industry standard is about 46%. Interestingly though, we do see a um, distinction among the three EGMs, where for example, resilience sees huge gains using our BERT-based model, whereas nutrition sees slightly smaller gains. Um, we found this result quite intriguing, and we hypothesized that this is based on the um, frequency-based uh, modeling of the industry standard. So as you can see, the blue BERT line is similar across all three EGMs, but the real big difference comes in how well the industry standard can perform. And we hypothesize that, um, see how it performs worse for resilience, but better for nutrition. This is likely because uh, resilience as a concept is quite nebulous. And so being able to model and understand if a document is talking about resilience requires quite a bit of semantic understanding. This is something that our BERT-based model can do, but maybe the frequency-based models um, perform worse at because they're only looking at individual terms. 
And we can see for nutrition, for example, certain keywords like food, health, nutrition, storage might come up and um, be good indicators that a document should be able to, uh, should be included in, in a nutrition EGM. So these results give us an interesting insight as to when the BERT-based model really shines and should be, should be used. So finally, some key takeaways. We found that our model, which is um, BERT plus active learning, outperforms the industry standard in both classification performance and human effort saved for all three EGMs. Um, it is important to talk about some of the challenges we faced. And most of these came from the real world deployment and um, that characteristic of our work. So one of the first things is that to perform machine learning, we often need a data set. And in this case, uh, we were lucky to be working with 3IE, but we needed a large, well-labeled, accurately labeled data set. And that's um, a non-trivial ask. Additionally, um, there's a big cost to communication. So our iterative process of um, training a model, sending back results, getting feedback and repeating um, took a lot of effort and a lot of email communication and data set merging, uh, which is not a trivial aspect of the work. And um, moving on quickly to future work, uh, we did see that this was quite effective at title abstract screening, and we would be very excited to move forward to look at full text screening as well, seeing how our models can perform um, evaluating documents at this stage. Additionally, we propose incorporating new active learning techniques and um, using generative models for summarization, which can be used to synthesize evidence and um, provide a small factor um, reading for experts to quickly get an understanding of the field. So thank you. And with that, I'll hand it over to our 3IE colleagues to talk about some of the results. Hi, everyone. Um, Rocking over here from 3IE. Uh, we're going to just bring the slideshow back up. Uh, so now we are going to uh, have brief presentations on each of the four uh, evidence gap maps, uh, starting with uh, the one that I led on agriculture led growth. Uh, so we can go on to the next slide. So um, go straight to the next one. Uh, so in this uh, EGM, we started with uh, developing a framework of interventions and outcomes, as Carolyn was describing. And uh, we had a lot of, a couple dozen each of uh, interventions uh, that we categorized studies into and outcomes that were measured. Uh, and we grouped these into uh, larger domains. Um, and uh, in terms of the intervention domains, uh, these have long descriptive names, but basically, uh, there's one on uh, we call delivery and dissemination of innovations. Uh, these are largely interventions that target producers trying to promote access to and adoption of improved agricultural technologies. Uh, there's a domain focused on markets. Uh, it's any intervention that's trying to increase the efficiency and accessibility of markets, improve uh, information flow within markets. Um, and then finally, a, an intervention domain related to the uh, policy and regulatory environment. And then uh, for the outcomes, if you uh, look at this list kind of top to bottom, um, it, it kind of goes in order of starting with rather uh, small scale, um, more immediate or intermediate outcomes, and then builds towards uh, you know, sort of more larger scale downstream outcomes. So it starts with things like, um, farmers' adoption of technologies, farm level output, kind of household level economic and um, well-being outcomes, uh, and then moving to things like uh, empowerment related outcomes, environmental impacts, uh, <clears throat> uh, more kind of macro level economic outcomes at the level of the market. And then finally, uh, outcomes related to investment in the agriculture sector as a whole. That's so then on to the next slide. And in terms of what we found, uh, we identified about 1,600 impact evaluations and around 60 systematic reviews. And so this is, we would consider to be a fairly large evidence gap map 
Um, it's not the largest we've done, but it's one of them. Uh, so there is a substantial literature in this field. Uh, in terms of where the evidence is concentrated, uh, it's, it's pretty heavily concentrated in a relatively small number of countries. Um, a lot of evidence concentrated in East Africa, India, Bangladesh, China, um, Nigeria, Ghana. Uh, if you work in the, the kind of global evaluation field, uh, a lot of these countries uh, kind of the usual suspects. Uh, there are countries that tend to have a lot of this type of research and we see that reflected in the agriculture sector. Uh, but one thing that, that kind of stands out is there are countries uh, like the DRC, for example, where you have, these are large countries, large populations, uh, where a lot of the population is working in the agriculture sector, uh, but we don't necessarily have a lot of evidence uh, about what works in that particular context, uh, there being 16 uh, evaluations from DRC. Uh, so there are uh, definitely some, some gaps where certain types of evidence would be very useful to have, and we don't have uh, a lot of it. Next slide. So these are some of the results of what we found uh, kind of broken down by those intervention categories. Uh, there are a lot of individual categories. Uh, it's easy to get lost in the details, but the, the kind of key takeaways from our perspective um, that uh, in that training and innovations domain, again, uh, those are interventions that target producers and uh, smallholders in particular, uh, trying to promote access to and adoption to technologies. Uh, we see a lot of evidence concentrated there. Uh, and then within the other domains, the markets and the regulatory environment, uh, th there's less evidence uh, all told. And even those uh, kind of subcategories where we do see a number of studies, uh, there are things like access to insurance and financial products um, and uh, uh, securing land rights. So things that also uh, tend to be mostly focused on, uh, on producers and smallholders in particular in a lot of cases. Um, so if you're working on programming in those areas, uh, this is good news. There's a lot of uh, evidence out there to rely on. Uh, again, we recommend starting uh, with systematic reviews as, as the place to get uh, kind of an up-to-date picture of uh, what the totality of evidence um, on a particular intervention or, or outcome looks like. Uh, where we see just a lot less evidence are things that target um, aspects of uh, markets and the regulatory environment uh, that go beyond the producers. So in the markets space, um, kind of the non-producer actors, so um, input suppliers, aggregators, uh, you know, interventions targeting those aspects and linkages between um, those folks and the producers, uh, we, we see a lot less evidence on those. So there may well be uh, plenty of programming that's targeting those aspects of uh, markets and regulatory environments, uh, but at least based on what we've seen, they don't seem to be studied uh, in the same way as um, those kind of producer-oriented uh, interventions. Okay, next slide. Uh, there's kind of a similar um, kind of skewing of, of evidence when we, see, when we look at the outcomes. So there's a lot of evidence um, uh, focused on those uh, you know, smaller scale or, or uh, more immediate or intermediate outcomes, those related to adoption, farm level outputs, um, and those kind of household level uh, economic or well being outcomes. Uh, when it comes to things that are a bit further downstream and broader in scale, uh, like empowerment, environmental uh, impacts, and those kind of slightly more macro level or at least market level. Uh, economic outcomes. It's not that we don't see these being measured at all. Um, there is some evidence, but just these things are a lot less likely uh, to be measured in impact evaluation studies. Uh, and then kind of an outlier here is um, the uh, investment in agriculture sector uh, outcome group. Uh, this is hardly ever uh, measured. And uh, given the types of interventions that might be expected to influence uh, the level of investment in the agriculture sector, kind of institutional level uh, programs or in, uh, interventions. Uh, those things are difficult to evaluate, so it's perhaps not surprising uh, that we wouldn't see this measured as an outcome very often, but uh, we did confirm that from, uh, from our research. Okay, next slide. And uh, here are just uh, 
a handful of um, just other you know, kind of patterns and, and characteristics in the evidence base. Uh, I won't go through all of these in detail, uh, just call attention to a few things and then happy to follow up uh, during the Q&A uh, on anything here. But um, uh, when we zoom out and, and look at um, evidence across different regions, uh, there is a lot of, uh, there are more uh, impact evaluations conducted in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, than all of the other regions combined. But uh, as we saw in the earlier figure, uh, that evidence is very highly concentrated in a handful of countries within Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and then just the um, pie chart that you see in the bottom right, um, where we say accounting for gender and equity is rare. Um, I'll say a bit about what we mean by this. So. Uh, what we're capturing there is whether uh, and in what way the evaluation study uh, accounts for gender or equity considerations in the research design. So this is asking, are they doing subgroup analysis? Uh, are they uh, adopting um, an equity sensitive analytical framework in their research design? Um, so, uh, and, and there we find just overwhelmingly uh, in most cases, no. Um, this isn't really being addressed at all in the research design. So uh, again, even if there is programming going on in um, this area uh, that are you know, equity sensitive programming or you know, gender responsive uh, types of interventions uh, may be going on, but the studies that are evaluating uh, the programming that's out there uh, are not set up in a way that's going to give us a good sense of the impact of these interventions on uh, gender and equity related outcomes. So that's something that uh, the field needs to do better. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to hand over to Charlotte to talk about the nutrition EGM. Thanks. Hi, um, next slide. Yeah, so I'm Charlotte Lane and I led our nutrition sensitive agriculture EGM which we did with RFS's Center for Nutrition. So what we tried to do here was align the big buckets of interventions and outcomes that we made with the programmatic and strategic approaches that RFS uses. And this also reflects how implementers and programmers are actually approaching their decision-making process. So generally speaking, groups have a lane that they're going to be functioning within if that is food production, food processing, food transport, they're going to be selecting interventions within those broader categories. And then what we wanted to do was break these down further into specific um, modes of application for the interventions. So we had groups of interventions related to direct provision, educational approaches, market-based approaches, and then systemic approaches to achieving change. So just as an example here, if you think about improved seeds within the food production bucket, you could have a intervention which gave farmers improved seed varieties. You could have an intervention which taught farmers about improved seeds. You could have some sort of market-based approach which linked farmers to retailers of improved seed varieties. And then you could have a systems level approach about like the regulation of improved seeds. Um, so I will say for food production, we didn't really have those systems approaches, but that's the idea of what we were trying to do here, breaking it across the different intervention types wherever that made sense. And so we ended up with 60 specific interventions, and then we did a similar approach for our outcomes. So we clustered these outcomes around food accessibility and affordability, including economic outcomes, as well as food movement and spoilage. And we had another cluster of interventions around dietary behaviors, which included like the motivators for those behaviors, as well as the outcomes and the specific um, diet measures that resulted from those behaviors. Then we had a group around the enabling environment, such as exposure to advertising or enforcement of regulations. And then finally, we just had another bucket that included a variety of additional nutrition and food security outcomes. Next slide. So we ended up with almost 2000 impact evaluations and over 150 systematic reviews. Most of the impact evaluations used experimental designs. So 64% were experimental studies with the rest being quasi-experimental studies. And when I get to this later, I think that that drove the types of interventions that were evaluated. 
about half of the systematic reviews were rated as low quality. So what this means is even though we have a really robust body of primary evidence, we don't have that many higher medium confidence systematic reviews that allow us to reach generalizable conclusions about how these interventions are likely to work. Um, geographically, we found that the distribution was pretty similar to what the ag team found. So there was a cluster of evidence in India, Bangladesh, and Kenya. This is probably driven by a combination of population size, food insecurity, and ease of working in some of these countries. So like Mark said earlier, um, DRC is pretty tough to work in, so that might be why it is relatively understudied. Next slide. This is the distribution of the intervention of the impact evaluations by intervention group. In our full report, we do have that broken down by each of the specific interventions. But what you can see here is that there's a focus on consumer behavior, pricing and profit initiatives, and food production. Within the consumer behavior interventions, most of the studies looked at either nutrition classes or peer support for the adoption of healthy dietary practices. Within the pricing and profit bucket, we had a lot of studies on conditional and unconditional cash transfers, as well as the provision of credit. And then in our food production bucket, we had agricultural education and the provision of agricultural inputs. We found a couple of places where there were groups of primary studies, but there weren't that many systematic reviews, so this would be opportunities for additional evidence synthesis. These included educational and market-based approaches to help traders move into new markets, educational and direct provision approaches to supporting food processing and packaging, including on-farm post-harvest processing, water and access and management interventions, and women's empowerment interventions. So what we're seeing here is that across all of these different groups, there's a pattern of focusing on direct provision and educational approaches as opposed to market-based and systemic approaches to achieving food systems transformation. So this gets back into the uh, designs that were used. The distribution of interventions is probably linked to the reliance on experimental designs over quasi-experimental designs. Direct provision and educational approaches are just easier to randomize they're probably going to achieve change in the relatively short time scales that we function in. And we've also been doing them longer. There's recently been a mental shift in the global community around um, now starting to do more of these market-based and systemic interventions. And so we need that evidence base to build up still. Um, like Carolyn said, the fact that we don't have much evidence doesn't mean that these don't work. It just means that there are emerging approaches that we should start building a body of evidence around. So I'm happy to talk about that in the Q&A, but for now, next slide. Um, and so here we have the distribution of outcomes. Again, in the full report, these are broken down more. But what you see is a similar pattern here where most of the outcomes are focusing on diet quality and adequacy and anthropometric outcomes which don't really reflect um, systems level change. We do have some studies looking at economic outcomes, largely income, but that's definitely less studied. And there's almost no studies that look at food spoilage or regulatory enforcement. Next slide. And so this just gives you a little bit more context on the types of studies that we found. Most of these interventions take place in rural contexts and they function at the village level. Again, this is going to be reflecting the types of um, studies that we're able to do and not necessarily the types of interventions that are being implemented and affecting a lot of people. Those tend to take place at the national level. We found that 15% of studies were evaluating national level programs. This is small, but it's actually a lot higher than we see in other maps, which is promising. I think that as our tool belt for doing these evaluations gets bigger and more robust, we might see more of these evaluations of large programs. So we're starting to see use of like synthetic control methods, regression, discontinuity, and interrupted time series, as well as leveraging on um, big data and remote sensing data that can help us to 
evaluate these more difficult to evaluate interventions and start building up the evidence base there. Um, most studies did not target a specific food product or population. So I'm only showing in this graph the studies that did have a specific target. And those tended to focus on fortified foods or nutrient rich foods, and they targeted infants under six months of age. So this is probably reflecting current priorities, which relate to like the first thousand days, as well as food fortification initiatives. Uh, we are not seeing that much on ultra processed foods or foods targeting women of reproductive age or people with non communicable diseases. So I'm happy to take more questions on this in the Q&A, but for now, I think it goes back to Carolyn. Thank you, Charlotte. So now I will quickly run through um, some key findings from the Resilience Evidence Gap Map, which represents the first evidence gap map to our knowledge on um, strengthening resilience. Next slide. The scope of the Resilience Evidence Gap Map was primarily defined around USAID's definitions of resilience, um, and that includes the ability of people, households, communities, countries, and systems to mitigate, adapt to, and recover from shocks and stressors in a manner that reduces chronic vulnerability and facilitates inclusive growth. So a couple of key features about this um, is the higher level and systems um, focus in addition to households, and then also the focus on shocks and stressors. Um, in terms of the specific interventions, we, we looked at RFS's programmatic approaches um, and those that were commonly used within the resilience strengthening sector. Um, and these often had explicit connection to enhancing preparedness, mitigation, or recovery. Um, and we focused primarily on settings that had covariate shocks and stressors. The outcomes really come from uh, Benet and colleagues' um, conceptual framework, um, the three capacity frameworks, which focus on absorptive, adaptive, and transformative capacities. And for indicators, we derive these from USAID's resilience capacity measurement typologies. Next slide. In total, we found 363 studies, 345 of which were impact evaluations and 19 of which were systematic reviews. The, ge the geographic concentrations of evidence were in Sub-Saharan Africa as well as South Asia. And in particular, you can see that um, countries like Ethiopia, Kenya, India, and Bangladesh were the most evaluated settings. We found few studies, few to know, in um, the Middle East and North Africa, um, and uh, the in Latin America and Caribbean were underrepresented. Next slide. This visual represents a tree map of all the studies that we found um, and the relative size of the evidence base. So we divide it by the types of shocks or stressors, whether slow onset, variable onset, um, or rapid or sudden onset. And you can see that most of the studies we um, found were examining interventions that address drought and then followed by conflict slash war slash terrorism. And then um, you can also see um, there were a lot of interventions that address flooding. Uh, you can do more filtering of these shocks and stressors to examine the evidence base on our evidence gap map. Next slide. In terms of findings, it's probably an, uh, an unsurprising finding that about more than half of this evidence base um, had multi -component, multiple component intervention approaches within them. That means that there were activities, um, multiple activities, sometimes spanning different types of intervention domains. Um, in fact, about 30% of the studies had uh, we're evaluating interventions that came that uh, represented multiple domains, and we saw a lot, um, or the biggest representation of evidence combining social protection and financial inclusion approaches. And I think this really reflects the field's thinking on strengthening resilience from a multidimensional standpoint. In terms of the most evaluated interventions, um, we saw cash transfers psychosocial, 
and technological solutions, um, which were non-agricultural, non-infrastructural, um, such as crop failure safeguards, improved seeds, fertilizers, climate smart ag, uh, water purification and irrigation systems. Um, these were the most evaluated. Where we don't see as much evidence is in some of the higher level and systems approaches. So for instance, disaster risk financing, early warning systems, these are all intervention approaches that are mentioned by um, the resilience field, but we, we just didn't find as much evidence. Next slide. In terms of the outcomes, um, we see that uh, really financial indicators, financial well-being um, was well evaluated. This probably represents um, the this is actually a reflection of the um, well-represented literature that examines social protection as well as financial instruments. And we also see use of coping strategies was also um, a commonly examined outcome. And this is probably linked to the psychosocial interventions. And, and as I mentioned before, where we see the ab absence of gaps in terms of systems level um, and um, interventions that target um, higher levels beyond the household um, are also represented in these outcomes. So for instance, um, in social bonding or social capital, we see that there's underrepresentation of producer organization participation in livelihoods, less examined on market systems resilience, um, and, and similarly other uh, you know, institutions level outcomes like local budget allocations um, and, uh, and things like long-term green infrastructure. Next slide. Now I will quickly highlight some of the findings from our water sanitation and hygiene um, evidence gap map, um, and, but I won't focus too much on this. Um, next slide. So this was a really novel um, evidence gap map that 3IE to its long um, history of 15 years working on evidence gap maps, we had never done examined research questions like this before. And really what we did here was try to understand um, the research base that examines the achievement of intermediate wash outcomes towards the contribution of higher level development outcomes. So it's a different place within um, a, a kind of global theory of change. And in particular, we examined um, if improvements in drinking water, sanitation and hygiene outcomes and access to those are associated with the high level outcomes like prosperity, stability and resilience. Um, and uh, yes, okay, next slide. So, because we were examining these high level outcomes, we expanded the inclusion criteria beyond just impact evaluations and systematic reviews, and we included observational studies. One limitation of observational studies is that we cannot determine the direction of causality. So um, it could be that um, an outcome is associated with another outcome, but it may not be the cause of that outcome. Um, so we just want to caveat that, but we didn't want to limit um, the evidence base here. And so in terms of the total number of studies, we, we found a surprising number of studies, about 279, um, 211, 211 of which were quantitative observational studies and 49 of which were impact evaluations. Um, and you'll see that we see concentrations of evidence um, primarily linked to population level intermediate wash outcomes, like the access to drinking water, sanitation, hygiene, uptake of hygiene practices. Um, and um, it's not very surprising to see that there's a cluster of evidence related to education um, between menstrual health and hygiene outcomes and education, because a lot of school attendance and absences are outcomes targeted by these types of programs. So I think the main key, the main takeaway here is that um, the, the field may want to think about doing similar types of evidence mapping to understand um, how sectors 
relate to other sectors and how they are contributing to the overall global development goals. Um, but one thing to caveat is that, you know, we found few impact evaluations, um, which suggests that, um, you know, more evidence probably needs to be generated examining these higher level uh, associations. Um, and then finally, um, we also found very specific gaps in terms of um, research questions. So uh, gaps in conflict and climate linked outcomes. Um, and there were very few studies, uh, for instance, that examined um, migration um, as a result, uh, the linkage between wash and migration outcomes. Okay, next. Now I will run through some of the project-wide learnings, and we will talk about the EGM-specific learnings as well as the machine learning learnings. Next slide. Next. So the key takeaway here is that um, after looking at all of the studies that underline RFS's strategic and programmatic approaches, we really found that there is an abundance of evidence, but it is often driven by well-evaluated interventions. Um, and in particular, we list out um, the interventions here. Um, but as I mentioned before, and other colleagues have mentioned before, we found fewer studies in systems level um, and, um, you know, diversity of um, of actors, for instance, in the private sector um, or public sector or quasi public sector as well, um, which suggests that more evidence is really needed um, in order to generate more evidence um, to understand if these higher level policies are effective, are, are effectively addressing development outcomes. Next. An implication of the limited body of primary evidence means that we see similar trends in evidence synthesis. And a key feature of evidence synthesis studies such as systematic reviews is they look at a saturation of evidence. Um, and we always caveat that uh, the dangers of looking at single studies um, and trying to extrapolate those results across multiple contexts. As we know, context really matters and what works in one setting may not work in another. And while a single study may give us some indication, um, it will not confirm whether uh, you know, certain intervention approaches are going to be necessarily effective in others. So, um, Basically, the absence of primary evidence um, and then the kind of downstream effect of absence of evidence synthesis, such as systematic reviews, means that we really don't know um, how program effectiveness is operating, especially, especially if we're asking about generalizability. And um, this was uh, perhaps very salient within the resilience evidence gap map. We saw a lot of multi-sectoral approaches um, and different combinations of, of evidence, uh, well, of interventions that were being applied. And what we really don't know is, you know, some very fundamental questions. Is a single sector or uh, intervention approach more effective than these portfolio approaches? Are there a specific combination of approaches that um, are more effective than others? And, and I think this, illustrate some really, this has implications for policymakers who are thinking about um, scarcity of resources and how to prioritize and achieve the most impact, um, as well as uh, program implementers who are trying to maximize impact as well. Next. As I mentioned before, we saw many gaps in systems level interventions and we list examples here. Um, we really encourage that the, um, the sector continue to advance the knowledge base. And in particular, this means policymakers, program implementers, and researchers really have to coordinate. Um, and for some of these harder to evaluate interventions, 
Future efforts require intentionality in the design and evaluability of programs. And so in particular, um, making sure that if we see a key opportunity to fill an evidence gap, that we, we are taking it um, and that we are making sure that implementation and evaluation are going on hand in hand. And if in the absence of those opportunities, seeing if quasi-experimental methods can be applied on existing data to then evaluate program effectiveness. Next. And then finally, as illustrated across the EGMs, there are dimensions that are, are underrepresented, like cost effectiveness, um, like mixed methods approaches, um, as well as gender and equity issues that may tell us more about, for instance, how programs are affecting female um, headed households, female farmers, as opposed to um, you know, general population. Um, they, there's an absence of evidence on how things are affecting marginalized populations, and th this is where evidence is direly needed. Next. Okay, next. As Kristen illustrated, we took a, a, an interesting um, and innovative approach to understanding how machine learning could accelerate the evidence aggregation process, and we found that while we were able to improve on existing classification models to reduce time and effort, the real world constraints are um, indeed um, potential limitations um, to fully realizing those efficiency gains. And so the app, um, we were able to leverage 3IE's um, impact evaluation and systematic review data, uh, but training data is a very real limitation. And I think those who are thinking about incorporating machine learning really need to not see it as a, um, you know, a one, uh, a single bullet, uh, a single approach that can solve all problems. Um, and, and similarly, coordination and understanding processes as well as evidence synthesis versus machine learning processes is real. Next. And finally, um, you know, we, we took a very realistic um, approach to try and uh, test machine learning capabilities, but in general, there are greater questions um, and, and more piloting could be done to understand how effectively machine learning can assist um, in evidence aggregation and synthesis throughout the entire study life cycle. So here we targeted um, you know, the acceleration of title and abstract inclusion and screening, but there are other labor intensive steps where we could do testing, like for instance, on full text inclusion, um, classification of complex technical concepts, as well as data extraction. These are also very time and labor intensive. Okay. Great, so that concludes um, our presentation and now we will move to Q&A. And in particular, um, we have uh, a set of questions uh, around machine learning as well as the evidence gap maps. Um, and so from Russell Crawford, um, for, for Kristen and machine learning colleagues. Um, there's a question. As a frequent user of both BARD and ChatGBT, I am concerned about the accuracy of both systems. I have found that they can give inaccurate answers, and for that reason, they cannot be depended upon for answers to difficult questions. <clears throat> what type of cross-referencing for the accuracy of the answers received are used? How can we trust the accuracy? And then there's maybe a related question as well from Tracy Mitchell um, that talked about accuracy as well. And um, Tracy found that it is interesting that the traditional models for nutrition and ag are more accurate than resilience, making BERT more useful for resilience. Both nutrition and ag are actual sectors with developed research, while resilience is more cross-cutting. And I wonder if the BERT approach is therefore more useful for topics that are generally cross-cutting versus a well-developed field. So I think, Kristen, we have um, questions around accuracy, the specific um, types of ML approaches, and the evidence base. And maybe you can touch on all of those. Thank you. Yes, sounds great. Yeah, thank you for your questions. Um, first, for um, the question from Russell Crawford, thank you for the question as well. Um, to start, uh, 
BARD and ChatGPT are generative language tools. Um, so their main um, contribution is generating text in response to um, a prompt. Uh, BERT is slightly different, um, which is the model that we used in that its primary goal is to encode language and um, understand it. So we used it, for example, to encode documents and then classify those documents as include or exclude for full text screening. Um, so in this way, our BERT model is a little bit different from ChatGPT and BARD um, in terms of the types of questions it's answering and how it answers those questions. Um, so instead of generating a response, instead we fine tune BERT on labeled data from um, 3IE, which is labeled in a binary fashion as include or exclude. Uh, our BERT model learns those um, patterns and then we use that fine tuned model in order to classify new documents. Um, in terms of ensuring accuracy for this part of it, uh, we use a kind of classic test, train, validate um, split among our data. So we train our model on one portion of the data set, and then we both validate and test it on um, information it's never seen before. And we can use that in order to get a good understanding of how well our model actually performs. And then lastly, um, because of the human AI nature of our team, um, our ML model, our machine learning model provides predictions and suggestions for a document's inclusion, um, how it should be classified. But then ultimately, um, expert screeners at 3IE check those predictions and suggestions, and every single document that will be included is checked first by a um, expert rater. So there's this sort of like checks and balances kind of built into our workflow, um, and then. Uh, as for Tracy's question, I agree. Um, it is really interesting, the kind of distinction of where the BERT model um, really shines uh, in comparison to the industry standard versus where both perform quite well. Um, and as I mentioned, we had predicted that it was maybe based on the um, like building blocks of the model that the industry standard models look at individual keywords uh, in order to classify documents. And that was my kind of prediction as to why for more nebulous topics that require more semantic understanding, we might perform, we might see even better gains with BERT. But I think you bring up a really excellent point that it could also have a lot to do with um, what fields are well flushed out. Um, and I think that does tie into semantic understanding. So for resilience, which as you mentioned, is more cross cutting versus well-developed, um, perhaps the model is able to understand because our BERT model has greater semantic understanding than a frequency-based model. Um, perhaps that is why it's able to perform well. Um, but yeah, I think that's a really interesting insight and I appreciate you bringing up you know, your expertise in in identifying where BERT might outperform. Great, thank you, Kristen. Now we have a series of questions um, about the EGMs. And so um, I will actually turn some of these over to Mark to answer. Um, so, uh, there is a question about, uh, actually, I, I will answer the first one. So from Rolano Briones, um, how did you handle multiple evaluations within a single paper? In other words, does the data count, does the count data pertain to papers or evaluation subjects? If the latter, then we may have a narrow, narrower range of papers generating the evidence gap map. Um, so each time a paper mentions an intervention and um, it is being evaluated um, and it is includable within our EGMs, um, we 
we um, tag that uh, as includable. Um, however, there are a set of other um, criteria that are needed as well, for instance, relevant outcomes um, to the evidence gap map. So um, in particular, just to say that um, a study um, can be counted across multiple intervention groups, but it is only represented once when, within the evidence gap map. So if it spans multiple domains, it is likely it, within the multi-component um, portion of an evidence gap map. If it is from a specific domain, but it just happens to be multiple activities within that domain, for instance, like multiple financial inclusion, um, you know, related interventions, then it will, you can find that uh, in that specific domain. Um, okay, and then uh, there's a question from Gasha Delessa um, from Ethiopia. Um, and uh, the question is, did the scope include all social classes, all regions covered? Um, so, just a reminder that the inclusion criteria are low and middle income countries, and we use the World Bank's um, classification system to define that. Um, for systematic reviews, um, as long as there was a mention of a low and middle income country and it was analyzed within the systematic review, then we include as well. And in terms of so social classes, um, we did not limit based off of um, a particular socioeconomic group. Um, however, you can also use filters um, to examine specific marginalized populations and studies that have analysis or targeting of the program based on that. Uh, and then finally, there's a question about, did you also expand your search beyond English language documents or papers? Um, so this is a really good question. Um, in general, we did use, uh, we. English was the primary language that we were searching for, uh, but some teams were able to um, screen for Spanish papers as well, um, and, and there were other teams that could screen in Italian or French. Um, for this, we would ask you to look um, at the methodological sections of our uh, reports to determine uh, if uh, the language that you're interested in was included. Okay, now, um, I will turn over to Mark for a question about EGM methods. <laughs> Mark, you've been patiently waiting. Um, are there, so this is a general question, um, but are there evidence-based guidelines and checklists that users can use with the maps? Um, so my, my first um, thought, and, and Mark, you can supplement, is that what users should do is really consult the reports to understand how the interventions are categorized. Um, and that will really help you see um, which interventions and evidence base you're looking at. Um, but then there are even more resources um, that can be consulted alongside the maps, um, including those around the methods of the systematic reviews. And, and we include more detail on that in the maps. Um, Mark, do you have anything else you want to add about this particular question? Um, I would just say I'm not sure if uh, we have um, documents that are you know, specifically for you know guidelines on um, using this kind of evidence. But uh, in within each uh, EGM report, there's a section on like you know, implications for uh, different audiences, for researchers, for policymakers, and practitioners. And there we try to uh, bring out you know. Uh, within the context of this particular evidence base, how can you use uh, what we found in the map? Um, and uh, a lot of our reports will also include um, some information on like how to use an EGM in general, um, depending on whether we're trying to produce a shorter report or not. Sometimes you know, we kind of condense that off the top of my head. I know our uh, food systems and nutrition uh, EGM, uh, the uh, initial report for that, uh, that, that Charlotte led, um, has uh, a nice section on that. Um, it may be that you know, we have that same information elsewhere, but that's where one place I know you can find it. So I'll share a link to that. Um, I think that provides uh, a good um, overview of the ways that you can use um, an EGM uh, to get insights on kind of what works and um, 
and, and how to incorporate the evidence into your decisions. Um, so, but just one for, as an example, um, the first thing we always suggest is uh, we classify the systematic reviews that we find um, by our confidence in their findings based on their uh, the way they conducted the review, their methods. Um, and so, for anything that's classified as, as a high confidence review, um, you know that that's going to uh, provide a, um, a good overview of uh, all of the research on a particular topic, and um, is really the best way to um, quickly get to well, what does the evidence say? Um, you know, uh, what types of interventions are, are well supported or what do we know about how to affect certain kinds of outcomes. Um, so that's always the first thing. And then depending on the, the use case, there's various other guidance we provide. But like I'll say, like I said, I'll um, put a link to the uh, food systems report in the chat um, and people can start there. Thanks, Mark. Um, Okay, so there are some questions about the EGM findings and implications. Um, so from Sarah Lauder, um, her comment is, is it possible to generalize about the effectiveness of individual interventions? I did some literature review on about 10 different interventions and it was tough to draw conclusions about effectiveness, but it would seem to me that that is what is needed. Um, yeah, Sarah, just just on your comment, um, I, I, we totally agree um, that, without generating um, evidence concentrations that are necessary for evidence synthesis um, and for us to develop a really robust um, average treatment effect of these programs, it's, um, it's hard for us to know um, about the effectiveness of single intervention approaches versus multiple component. And then when you start getting into combinations of approaches, um, this was something that really resonated within the resilience evidence gap map, where we, we simply don't know, you know, what combinations of approaches might be more effective. Um, and if there are trade-offs that have to be made in terms of resources um, or or you know dimensions of the context, we we just don't know what might be more effective, and I think this really suggests the the need um, for more research, but also for the evidence gap map um, in particular, um, those that examine multi component interventions to remain up to date, and for the for um, the development community to really be consulting to make sure that we're keeping um, a uh, tab on where. Uh, the evidence base is progressing and if we can answer such questions. Um, and then there's a question from Olga Manas um, regarding the intervention and outcome domains that don't have a lot of evidence. Do you have an idea of the most common reason for this? Meaning, is it because these are difficult to measure? Um, these aren't frequently considered during the evaluation stage or are these domains that aren't frequently implemented as interventions when thinking about the intervention domain? Um, so. Why don't I give Mark and Charlotte a um, quick opportunity to weigh in from their perspectives on the ag-led growth and ag um, and uh, nutrition sensitive ag EGMs. So why don't we see, what's the most common reason for why we're seeing evidence gaps? Mark, um, go ahead. Oh, oh, okay, Charlotte, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I'll jump in. And I do think that a lot of it is around a traditional assumption that we can't evaluate some of these. Um, I would push back pretty hard against that assumption. I think that there tends to be uh, a feeling that, you know, these national programs or these uh, market-based approaches are impossible to evaluate. And I would just say that they're hard to evaluate and that those are different. Um, and then also, I think there's the question of, are these newer approaches? There's no problem with us innovating. We should be innovating and we should not be hesitant to try out new things. So some of those gaps are just related to um, newer approaches. And the, then also some are related to the timescales on which we would expect these to function. Um, so if we're looking at some of those broader regulatory approaches, it's going to take years in order to achieve impact. And we just haven't had enough time in order to make those evaluations even sensible yet. Um, I'll just say, I definitely agree on um, the, and there was a question about this um, 
they came in and I provide, you know, wrote a response um, with some links to a couple of papers that um, do use, um, you know, with, with the right kind of data, you can evaluate um, kind of large scale institution level or national level policies and programs. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it, it's harder, but you can do it and it needs to be done. So um, we, we hope that uh, there'll be more of that. Um, and of course, uh, as was kind of alluded to there, uh, you know, those are uh, gaps on particular types of interventions that are maybe more difficult to evaluate. There are also uh, places where in the world where it's, it's harder to do evaluations, either because of uh, various forms of instability or even um, just, you know, they're not being the same kinds of networks um, established for, um, you know, research institutions and things like that. So um, there, there can be reasons for geographic gaps as well. Uh, there are some gaps though that, that uh, uh, others may have ideas, but are a bit puzzling. So in the, in the agriculture and EGM, um, you know, why there's so little focus on um, just like the functioning of agricultural markets and, and interventions that target, um, you know, the, the functioning of those markets and uh, linkages between different actors in those markets. Um, uh, those don't seem that, that much harder to evaluate than, than the other things, uh, the kind of uh, producer targeted uh, interventions. So, um, yeah, that, there are some that are a, a bit of a mystery, and maybe it's just you know not on the radar of uh, evaluators in the in the way that they should be. Thanks, Mark. And I think Charlotte and Mark, you touch upon um, a question that was um, asked by uh, Gesha Delessa as well, and and there was a comment about the interventions that are economy wide policies, like competition policies or trade policies, and and can they really be um, evaluated using RCT or quasi-experimental methods. And, and I think your responses um, very well address that. And, and I, I will say, I will add that um, while some of these interventions are difficult to evaluate using impact evaluation methods, quasi-experimental approaches have been used. So you can utilize in interrupted time series data. You can um, you know, often use if uh, if there were eligibility criteria like regression discontinuity design, um, if there were areas of a country that experienced um, or implemented a policy before others, you can use that exploit that um, heterogeneity to do um, impact evaluations and um, and just a, a nod to um, this past um, well to um, the you know, 2021 uh, economists um, who won the Nobel Prize in economics, this is what they did. Uh, they they use natural experiment methods um, to evaluate high level policies. And now you don't have to be a Nobel Prize winning economist to do this, but just to say that it is possible and it's being it's been done over the course of several decades. Now, with randomized control trials, yes, like it does require intentionality and coordination. Um, and, and this means that policymakers, implementers, and researchers have to be aligned and on the same page about how this is done. Um, Carolyn, can I just jump in and say that 3IE published a systematic review on the effects of uh, fiscal policies like taxes and subsidies to support a healthy diet. So that was all impact evaluation based and there was enough out there looking at these national level programs. So um, it is happening, not often, but we are seeing it, which means it's possible. Thank you, Charlotte. Okay, now we have a higher level question that I will direct to Chris and Zachary, um, and then maybe uh, Charlotte and Mark, if they have any thoughts. And this is from Emma Jolie. What role can funders, researchers, and implementers play in improving the evidence base around um, improving equity? Without making any assumptions about the underlying programs and their focus, how can we ensure that more evaluations effectively include different groups of people and can measure changes around them, among them? Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, maybe I'll share a few thoughts and then and hand over to colleagues for any additions they might have. Um, so on the first part, this is by no means exhaustive, but maybe a couple of things that I think folks can be thinking about in terms of improving the evidence base. One is 
I think it's really important to balance our efforts between generating new evidence and taking advantage and really leveraging the evidence that we already have. And so I think there's often a tendency to, you know, always wanting to, to create new things, but, and that is a critical component, but I think doing things like the evidence gap maps and really working on um, a synthesis of the, of the evidence we have is really critical. The second thing I think is important is prioritization. Um, you know, if you look at our evidence gap, the evidence gap maps that were done through this activity, <clears throat> you know, there are probably thousands of cells. And I don't think our approach should be equal investment in building the same evidence base in every one of those cells. I think it's really critical that we talk as a community about where are the priority gaps and really focus on those. Uh, and then the third, which is more focused on implementing partners, is I think the the most successful impact evaluations, this is both for funders and implementing partners, the most successful impact evaluations are going to be those where there's really close collaboration from the beginning between funders and researchers and implementers. Um, you know, with the idea of an impact evaluation in mind. And so I think really investing in those sort of cross organization relationships to, so that we, the evidence that we, the evidence generation that we do invest in is, is as high quality as possible, I think is really important. Um, in terms of in the last part of the question about including different groups of people and measuring changes over time, I think this gets to my earlier point about prioritization and really, you know, identifying key priorities and then using that to drive both the the focus and the methods that we use in divine, in, in designing the impact evaluations. So why don't I, I'll hand it over to colleagues to see if they have anything additional they'd like to add. So <laughs> silence. Um, let me just add that um, when we look at improving equity, um, I think this, you know, one really basic technical requirement, and this is kind of building off of Chris's comment about coordination for high quality research, um, is making sure that the, the programs are that are targeting um, populations where we have special, where we want to examine specific um, population outcomes, um, they need to be implemented at a scale um, and evaluated at a scale where we can develop robust findings. So one thing that we often see within um, the impact evaluations, for instance, is that we'll collect data on, for instance, gender or um, you know specific socioeconomic groups or marginalized. Um, communities, but sometimes it's not possible um, to have a, a robustly powered sample um, for that group. So that means that, you know, the standard errors that we develop around average treatment effects for these groups end up being very large. But in cases where it is not large and we, and we seek to explicitly examine how these populations are being affected by a program, we need to think about scaling and resources from a program implementation as well as evaluation point of view so that any measurement that's done um, can be robustly done and uh, not subject to a really high uh, margin of error. So I think that's just a, a more specific point about the need for coordination as well as um, making sure the resources are available to do so. Okay. Um, and with that, we are about at time. So um, just want to note that all of the data and the EGMs and the reports and the briefs um, are publicly available. We encourage you to use them. They are vast resources um, that should improve um, coordination and knowledge sharing among um, the community. So please do consult them. And uh, with that, we will uh, let Zachary have closing remarks. Well, 
uh, I always like to stick to time, so I will keep this brief. Um, Thanks everyone for joining us. I would like to thank also very much our colleagues um, for presenting today and for joining us on this adventure in kind of pushing the limits of uh, evidence gap maps and what we can do and uh, expanding you know, our understanding of how we can employ new and innovative methods such as machine learning uh, to facilitate a more efficient uh, you know, development of evidence gap maps. Uh, and I would also, you know, again, encourage, as Carolyn has to say, these are publicly accessible um, resources. So please do check them out. Um, please look how to apply them. We, within the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, will be looking to both build upon and expand upon these, as well as use them in our work uh, to inform kind of our analytical and learning agendas going forward. And so we will continue to um, expand on this and look forward to sharing, you know, our learning uh, uh, and additional resources in the coming days. And with that, I, you know, again, thank you for our participants for the very active chat for your Q&A and look forward to seeing you at a future AgriLinks event. Uh, so thank you. And with that,